City Christian Church. We're so uh, glad that to be finally uh, back worshiping together in person um, after a couple weeks off. I uh, hope everybody's healthy. Um, we are. Uh, we got a lot going on in the church. Um, you uh, welcome everybody who's listening on Facebook, watching on Facebook. Um, so uh, still with COVID, we're doing things a little differently uh, with communion. You can uh, partake in the back um, at your own pace. Uh, you can also uh, uh, drop your offering in the plate back there, or you can uh, text it um, to 84321 um, to any amount uh, to that number. Um, we, uh, we've also taken a couple weeks off of uh, Fall City students, but we're, we'll be back on this week, 6 to 8, here at the church. Um, and also, oh, volleyball. Volleyball starting back up 
tomorrow. It actually starts up tomorrow. So if you're interested in that, um, just let somebody know after the service and uh, we'll get you on a team and uh, we'll, uh, I guess we'll set teams tomorrow. So uh, I think that's about it. Uh, welcome everybody and uh, let's continue to worship.
short story um, went on a little plane trip to uh, to Kansas and uh, before we left it was so foggy you couldn't even see the end of the wings on the plane it was a really small plane and uh, like the kind of plane that you're sitting in the back and the pilot you can touch him on the shoulder that kind of plane and as we were flying takeoffs no big deal there's nothing in the sky necessarily that can hurt you but uh, as we were flying towards Kansas, you still can't see. Like we couldn't see anything. And as I'm watching, the, I can see the pilots are talking and they're calm and collected. And the couple gentlemen that were with me were freaking out. Because we realized that we were pretty close to where we needed to be. And I could see the altimeter. And as I'm watching the altimeter go down, I'm looking outside and I can't see anything. Completely out of control. And I think to myself, that's probably how the disciples felt when Jesus sat down at the table and he told them that he was gonna die. They probably felt helpless. They probably felt like they had no control. But Jesus, being the good pilot that he is, remained calm. Even in the garden when he was sweating drops of blood, his father gave him the encouragement to be strong. And he did exactly that. He was strong for his people. And even when the guards came and took over him, and Peter come wielding a sword. And everybody was in chaos. Jesus remained calm. And as the pilot was beginning to come down closer to the ground, he was still calm. And we were white knuckling our chairs. And all of a sudden, we hear that familiar sound of the wheels hitting the runway, and I never saw the ground. See, we're not in control. And I think when you realize that, and you can get some comfort in the fact that the pilot, you always watch the pilot. If the pilot's calm, it's okay. And Jesus is our pilot. And he remains calm. And we take this time every Sunday to, to reflect on what Jesus did for us. And this was all so that we could have comfort in him. We could have comfort in the fact that he's in control. So as we play and we commune with our Savior, I'd like for you to close your eyes. I'd like you, for you to reflect on that day how that day must have been and focus on Jesus focus on the calmness of Jesus in that process let's pray Father we thank you we thank you for the opportunity to just be here in your in your glory Father we, we thank you for your calmness we thank you for the ability to just look to you, to be calm and just be in you. Father, we ask that this calmness spread throughout the land. We ask that this calmness spread throughout everyone that can hear my voice and everyone that can lean on you for calmness. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Linda 
darkest place when I've lost my way. All I need is you in this mess that I've made. Well, I can't bear the way. All I need is you. You are rich in mercy, slow to anger. Your love endures forever. Who is like you? In all the world, your love endures forever, forever. When my eyes have seen, in my heart. All I need is you You are rich in mercy Slow to anger Your love endures forever Who is like you, Lord, in What a beautiful name it is What a beautiful 
name it is the name of Jesus Christ my King what a beautiful name it is nothing compares to this what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus seat. I'm coming from all the way back here, back behind the drums. I wish we had like some smoke or some sort of, some sort of magic trick that I could do to kind of jump out from there. Maybe we can rig something up with the ceiling where I can fly around or something. Wouldn't that be cool? Yeah, it would scare me. I don't know that I could trust the ceiling. <laughs> I mean, basically this entire worship space is held up with duct tape and zip ties anyway, so... And I'm about as heavy as I've ever been, so I don't know that zip ties and duct tape will work for me. So um, I want to start off by saying thanks to uh, Uncle Reggie. I call him Uncle Reggie. He just seems like that type of dude that he's everybody's uncle, right? We love Uncle Reggie. And uh, uh, we thank you for stepping in and leading. And then, um, and also, Chris, is this the first time you've led a song? Like, led, led a song here? Yeah, uh, we, fig- we figured that crap out this morning, so, uh, <laughs> and he did a good job, he surprised me, but he also got himself in trouble because we know if we need a leader, we got somebody now, so, and then of course Adam uh, doing his uh, walk downs on the bass, he-, he can't just sit still, he can't just do boom, boom, he's got to do crazy stuff, and then of course um, uh, the drummer, 
I'm just the eye candy. I can't really do a whole lot. So, no, I'm just kidding. It is great to be back, though. And I know we're a little kind of light on a crowd. I don't know if it's the weather or whatever it is. But those of you who are in Facebook land that could be here right now, you missed the chance to be here because I've been missing you. So, um, I, I, I really am happy to be back. It, it was only two weeks. But for some reason, uh, the first week was fine. I was cool being away from y'all for the first week. But after we hit like two Sundays, I was like, there's something about like being with your people on a regular basis. There's something about kind of drawing that strength from them or getting to pick on Quentin or having Quentin pick on me or, or whatever it is. Um, there's something about that. And um, it's kind of one of those situations where you don't know what you got till it's gone. And it was kind of gone there for a minute, and uh, I missed it. So I am super excited about being here today. I don't know if you guys are. I don't know if it's allergies or if you were up partying all night, but I'm super excited to be here. I wasn't doing either of those. No allergies, no parties. So I'm kind of boring. I went to bed at like 8.45. It was crazy. So we are jumping into a new series called Masquerade. I thought it was fitting, Right? I thought it was fitting, number one, because we have to wear freaking masks everywhere, right? <laughs> and number two, um, we're coming into October, so it's Halloween time. I don't, how many of you guys love Halloween time? I love Halloween time. I actually, I love uh, that moment from October 1st all the way through the end of the year. I, I call that the holidays. Like, that's the holidays for me. Like you get into the Halloween stuff and the fall stuff and everything tastes like pumpkin spice and um, or apple and cinnamon and stuff like that. And then the kids are excited and they get to pick out their costumes. And I think Cooper every other day has a different costume that he's going to want to be. This is going to get expensive for me. I don't know what's going on. He's got these plans of scaring people that scared him last year. All, all kinds of crazy stuff. But anyways, as we get closer to Halloween um, and we continue on with our girl Rona, um, I, found it, I found it fitting to talk about a masquerade, to talk about masks for the next several weeks. So um, masks can be fun, right? Masks can be scary. Anybody ever, ever gone to like Halloween store and been scared by somebody by the masks? I'll get into that later. I've had some fun with that. Anyways, um, masks can be annoying, they can also be a safety device. They could be a weapon. They can be a disguise to commit an offense. They can be a bit of a security blanket for some people. A mask can be a lot of things. And over the next uh, few weeks, we're going to talk about that. The, the, we use them uh, way more than we realize. We use, and I'm not just talking about the Rona mask. I'm talking about masks. All right. There are some benefits and some dangers to this, this masquerade. And I, and I want to highlight some of those over the next few weeks. We will, we will have some fun with it. We always have fun with it, right? We'll have some fun with it, and uh, we will hopefully learn something from it. But first, I, I want to dive into to some, some real deep stuff, like the Webster's Dictionary definition of a masquerade. So um, the definition, entry one of two, I'm going to try and be as professional as possible here. Um, it's a social gathering of persons wearing masks and off, often fantastic costumes. Uh, B, a costume for wear at such a gathering. And two, an action or appearance that is mere disguise or show. Masquerade, uh, the verb is masqueraded. I didn't know that until I looked this up. Um, uh, and uh, masquerading, uh, the definition, uh, entry two of two, is to disguise oneself, um, to go about disguised, to, to take part in a masquerade, to assume the appearance of something one is not. All right? So as we, as we talk about this, as we talk about masks, as we talk about masquerading, as we talk about the masquerade itself, I want you to think about that. To appear as though you're someone or a thing that you're not, right? And so whenever I think about a masquerade, I think about how we're all kind of hiding from things. We're all kind of dancing around things that we're insecure about or hiding from or dancing around things that we're embarrassed of, right? And, and, and the thing is, everybody does it in some 
way, shape, or form. You can say you're not, but then you're just masking yourself behind your perceived toughness, right? Uh, between your perceived grit. Everybody kind of masquerades and, and, and kind of dances around things at some point in time in their life. We put, we put on a smile when inside it feels like we're dying. Anybody ever done that? Anybody, anybody ever walk into church and have Ray or Vicky ask how you're doing today and you say, I'm great, but you fought with your spice, your spice, your spouse. Spice is the plural for your spouse, I think. Um, you, you fought with your spouse and kids all the way to church and you're not great, right? Like there's tension when you're sitting in church and you know that your wife is judging you saying, how can you sing what a beautiful name it is after all the things that you said to me on the way to church today, right? I mean, I've never experienced anything like that, but... Um, or, or what about those of you who kind of rock the RBF when you don't want to be bothered? That's a mask, right? If you look ticked off enough, people's going to leave you alone. That's a mask. That's part of the masquerade, right? Or, or what about those of you who hold back tears when King Triton gives his little girl away to be married to Prince Eric in The Little Mermaid, right? You ain't got to hold those tears back. That's a mask, y'all. Nobody else tears up at that moment? I do, but that's because I don't wear masks because I'm the pastor and I'm perfect, right? Um, but the list goes on and on. There's, there's all kinds of those little things that we do throughout the day that either make us feel like we fit in or keep us away from fitting in. And we're putting on that mask and we're kind of dancing around things and doing this masquerade. And, and the mask is something that we use in order to feel uh, which is funny, we didn't even discuss this, to feel like we're in control, right? But the thing about it is, is control is a myth. You can have all your crap together, and one thing can happen and jerk the rug out from under it all at once. I've been there a few times, right? Uh, so here are a few things uh, that we use masks for, and over the next few weeks, we'll get more specific, and uh, today is just kind of a flyover, um, of, of kind of what to expect out of the series. The first thing is masks allow us to hide. Masks allow us to hide. Let's be honest. We've all put on a fake smile before, right? Is this one fake or real? I can't tell. It's a little bit of both because I'm doing it on purpose and not on purpose at the same time. Uh, super awkward, right? Um, but it allows us to hide from how we really feel. How many of you guys smile when you're mad? Anybody? Why do we smile when we're mad? It's not funny. It's stupid, <laughs> right? Um, and, and, and what it does is it allows us to hide how we really feel about the person we just saw or that we're talking to uh, because a fake smile is better than punching that person in the throat, right? <laughs> so I just put on a fake smile instead of punching them in the throat because there's like charges and stuff that, that come with that. Or, or, or how many of us put on a, a brave face when we're actually scared to death? Whenever something goes down in the family or something that goes down in our life and you feel like, well, I'm the one that has to put on the brave face because everybody is depending on me, right? For almost two decades... I would take my high school youth groups to haunted houses around Halloween time. Um, and, and we went to some good ones. Some of those haunted houses are really scary. Some of them are super fun. Some of them are really scary. But the thing is, all right, I, believe it or not, which I think is scarier than a haunted house, was the responsible adult. All right. If that doesn't scare you already, then I don't know what else does. So I had to act all hard when really I wanted to scream like a little girl. I wanted to scream like a little baby. And I, and I do this thing when I'm, trying to, when I'm trying to push that back. Some of you guys have gone to these haunted houses with me. I don't know if you noticed, but I get this nervous giggle when I'm scared. It's, it's, a, it's a silly little giggle. I don't know if I can recreate it unless I'm scared. But I get this, this nervous giggle. And um, um, I really wanted to scream like a baby, but I had to act tough. And so uh, I wanted to run and I wanted to leave all these teenagers to fight for themselves against the, the drunk college student that smells like dip spit with the Jason mask on that's, that's yelling threats at you, right? And I'm sure it'd be a good life lesson for them. They could learn how to fend for themselves if I take off running, right? But, but I had to be the person in control. 
I had to be the responsible adult. I had to be the one that acted tough. Sometimes I didn't want to. And so instead of screaming like a little girl, I just had a nervous giggle. I, I suppressed that. Now I wake up in the middle of the night and I've got drunk college guy Jason yelling in my face saying he's going to rip my face off and wear it like a mask. Somebody, <laughs> that was actually said to me once. Um, still haunts me. Um, but the fact of the matter is that sometimes we put on a mask whenever we realize there's something to hide. Do you know how long that's been going on? Do you know how long hiding has been going on? Really since the beginning of time, right? It's as old as Adam and Eve. Check this out in Genesis chapter three. It says, uh, the woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious and, and she wanted the wisdom that it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and she ate it. She gave some to her husband who was uh, with her and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were open and suddenly they felt shame at their nakedness. Or if you're from the South, nakedness. Um, so, so they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. And when the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they, they hid, right? They hid from him. They hid from the Lord God among the trees. Uh, then the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I, I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Well, well, who told you you were naked? The Lord God asked. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? And so, so our natural inclination, whenever there is something wrong, is to hide. Is to cover it up, right? There are so many things going on in, in this story, right? First of all, sin. That's, that's probably the worst, right? Second, uh, the stupid thing is thinking that they can hide. First of all, thinking they can hide from God, but secondly, thinking they can just hide, right? Hide from one another, hide from the serpent, hide from the circumstances, hide from the fallout, thinking they can hide was a problem. And then third, realizing that they are naked and then trying to cover it up. I've never really put much thought into that part until I was studying for this sermon. Um, but they do realize that like he's the one that created them naked, right? And so they were shameful, but he's the one that kind of put the indoor plumbing and the outdoor plumbing uh, there for them, right? And, and, and so that's kind of like trying to change my three-month-old's diaper and, and them slapping my hand away saying, hey, I'm naked under there. Well, who's going to change their diaper, right? They, they were in a position where they needed God more than ever, kind of like whenever a three-month-old soils their diaper, right? They need you more than ever, but instead they covered up and tried to hide, It doesn't make sense, except for in the moment, that's what kind of makes sense to you. Think about it. How long do you think they'd have been able to hide um, from God if they could? I, I'd say he's probably the, the world champion hide-and-seek dude, right? God, I mean, he can kind of see everything all at once. There ain't no hide from him. And, and then, say they could hide. At what point do you come out of hiding? When you're hungry? When you're comfortable with being naked, when whatever fig leaves start itching, <laughs> whatever fig leaves that you put together start itching, at what point do you actually come out of hiding and then deal with the problem? Because that's the thing. That's what we're hiding from. That's what we're keeping from is dealing with the problem. Or do you just keep hiding and keep hiding until it blows up? How many of you guys have ever had a situation in your life that you push down and push down and push down, then all of a sudden you blow up and it's a bigger mess than what it would have been had you just dealt with it from the get-go? No one told Adam and Eve they were naked. They just knew something was wrong. Right? They just knew something was wrong. We have those things in our lives, right? 
We have those things that people don't really have to tell us and nobody could, could, maybe nobody could understand, but we just know something's wrong. And we need to deal with it, right? Those things that we're tucking away, those things that we're covering up, and instead of putting effort into hiding it, what we could do is maybe put some effort into dealing with it. And then all of a sudden, you learn you're a pure person, and, and, and storms are great. I, I say that. I don't want to jinx myself here, but storms are great because it produces refinement. So when you deal with things and it refines you, refinement comes at high, high heat and, 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 and a lot of pressure, okay? And it's oftentimes painful, but what it does is it kind of burns the impurities off of you and you become a better, purer version of who you just were. And so it's not a bad thing to deal with things. A lot of times what happens whenever you hide, you just prolong and amplify the problem at hand. The second thing is masks allow us to play, right? They allow us to play. Masks are fun. Uh, um, Every time uh, we'd go to the Halloween store when the boys were small, can you guess what I would do? Anybody? I'd put one on, the scariest one I could find. Or maybe the half mask, the old guy with the cigar coming out of his mouth with the trucker hat. That was always a good one, too. I put one on, I'd jump around the corner, I'd scare him, and they would cry. Like, not just cry, but they would run and cry. It could almost get dangerous, if you think about it. It was awesome at the time. And then I would laugh, because that's funny. Anybody else do that to their kids? Anybody? All right. We got like a brotherhood here. Did you say you did, too? That does not surprise me, Amy. You probably do that to other people's kids too, don't you? <laughs> but nowadays, the boys don't fall for that crap. They don't fall for that anymore, right? So I got to figure out how to get an element of surprise. Maybe I'll get Amy to hide around the corner and jump out and scare him and make him cry. We'll, we'll work something out after this, all right? Um, but, but masks, they're fun. Halloween is fun. It's one of my favorite holidays. It allows us to be someone that we're not for a night right? I mean, in my lifetime, I've been E.T. I've been Casper the Friendly Ghost. I've been a Transformer. I've been a Ghostbuster. I've been a vampire. And in sixth grade, I think this is the pinnacle of my Halloween life. I had a Halloween party at my house. My mom threw this awesome Halloween party. Um, And I was Homie the Clown. Do you guys remember Homie the Clown from In Living Color? Homie, don't play that. (laughs) <laughs> that's who I was. I was homie the clown. It was awesome. It was so much fun. And what other situation is it acceptable to be homie the clown? Yeah, I didn't think so, right? And so the problem is, is when we get so used to wearing masks and, and, and putting them on to hide things, we begin, and when we begin to do it for things other than Halloween, then everything kind of becomes that game, right? Right? Everything becomes this game that we're playing and and we're not necessarily us, but we are a person or a pawn in that game. And if we're not us, then we don't have to take responsibility for the crap that we do. Maybe not a game in the way you think, but a game where where we calculate everything, right? Even our feelings, where we prime and we calculate our approach in order to get the best of what we want out of, out of where we're going. And, and, and sometimes we compromise who we are and we become somebody that we're not in order to get ahead. Then all of a sudden life, which is what Jesus died for us to have, becomes a game. And that's not really a game to be played. And although the consequences are really, really real, we've kind of been playing this game of calculation. Does that, does that make sense? And, and there are aspects of our lives that most definitely are not a game. I want you to check this out. This is the Apostle Paul talking to King Agrippa. He's done some really cool stuff uh, over the past like 25 chapters of the book of Acts. And um, he's been arrested and the religious leaders want him dead and they've brought him before King Agrippa. So let's dive into this. It says, Then Agrippa uh, said to Paul, You may speak in your defense, because he's got to defend himself uh, for everything he's done. So Paul, gesturing with his hand, I don't even know 
what that gesture would be. Um, I know what mine would probably be. But um, he says, I am fortunate, King Agrippa, that uh, you're the one hearing my defense today against all these accusations made by the Jewish leaders. For, for I know that you're an es- expert on all Jewish customs and controversies. Now, please listen to me patiently. As the Jewish leaders are well aware, I was given a thorough Jewish training from my earliest childhood among my own people and in Jerusalem. If, if they would admit it, they know that I have been a member of the Pharisees, the strictest sect of the religion. Now, I am on trial because of my hope in the fulfillment of God's promise made to our ancestors. In fact, that is why the 12 tribes of Israel zealously worship God night and day, so they can share in the same hope that I have. Yet, our, Your Majesty, um, they accuse me for having this hope. Why does it seem um, incredible to any of you that God can raise the dead? I used to believe uh, that I ought uh, to do everything I could to oppose the very name of Jesus, the Nazarene. Indeed, I did just that in Jerusalem, authorized by leading priests. I caused many believers there to be sent to prison. And I cast my vote against them when they were condemned to death. Many times I had them punished in the synagogues to, to, to get them to curse Jesus. I was so violently opposed to them that I even chased them down in foreign cities. That sounds pretty intense, right? Now, how does that fit into to what I'm doing? How does that fit into a game? Because Paul's done these, these pretty huge things throughout the New Testament for the New Testament church by now, and the Jewish leaders, they're ticked off about it. Why? I mean, they're trying to get him arrested and then probably killed. Why are they ticked off? I mean, this is Paul telling Agrippa. Yeah, Agrippa, I used to play that game. I used to play that religious game. As a matter of fact, I was one of the best at it. I've played that game until I realized that it wasn't a game at all. This is what he's telling King Agrippa, one of the most powerful men in the world at this point in time in history. He says, I played that game, and you know I played that game, and you know how well I played that game, but this isn't a game at all. He says, I know this game because I've played it, but now I've met Jesus. And in this game that they're playing, what Jesus values most is what? People. But the Jewish leaders... They're using people as pawns. They're not even treating them like people. I've learned that, that, that people aren't pawns to be played, is what, is what he's saying to King Agrippa. He's saying, I'm here in defense of what I'm doing, but it's because I'm treating people like people, not people like pawns. And since Jesus didn't play their game, guess what they did? They killed him. And now that Paul's not playing their game, guess, guess what they want to do? They want to kill him. Now, when we play our games, typically, people don't die. Like, I've never murdered somebody over a game of Monopoly, even though if there was a game that would make you want to murder somebody, it'd be Monopoly. Um, but people don't die in the games that, that I play, right? I can honestly say that the games that I've played have never cost anybody their lives, but I can say sometimes the games that I've played have killed some relationships, in my life. It's killed some friendships. How many times have friendships or marriages and families been cut out of your life because of the game? That's the thing about a game. When you're playing a game, there's a winner and there's a loser. But honestly, what does the winner lose more by winning? when they play these kind of games, right? It's like getting in a fight with your wife and winning. Do you really win, guys? I mean, come on. You can be right and sleep on the couch, I guess. But you don't really win, because if you win, it's actually worse than losing a lot of the times, right? Jesus made it possible. Listen, Jesus made it possible for anyone who would accept him 
as their Lord and Savior to win. To him, it wasn't about pawns. It, it wasn't about games. It was about people and their salvation and the opportunity to live a life, not play a game, not do this religion crap, not use people as pawns in your game so that you can get ahead and so that you can be uh, self-important. See, these masks that we put on, a lot of times, they cause us to play like this is a game. And it's not. The third thing is masks allow us to take. You guys ever know that person or have that person in your life that never gives anything, but they are takers? Anybody? Nobody? Me neither. Um, Because if I'm robbing a bank, I need you to understand this. If I'm robbing a bank, I'm wearing a mask. I I don't want the camera seeing this. All right. As pretty as it is, I don't want the camera seeing this. I'm wearing a mask. That way people don't know who I am. As a matter of fact, I know what mask I would wear. If I'm going to rob a bank, I think I want to rob a bank in an ALF mask. I just think that would be so funny to be ALF and robbing a bank. I mean, come on. Could you imagine the, the security footage of ALF robbing your bank? That would be funny. I think it'd be priceless. In more ways than one. Um, Anyways, uh, but the the main reason is so that I could conceal my real identity. Right? So that I could gain from taking what doesn't belong to me and never have to own up to it. That's why I would wear a mask. Specifically an elf mask. But that's why I would wear a mask. So that I could gain, so I could take what I wanted and not be held responsible for taking what I wanted. Jesus kind of sees this, these religious leaders as kind of doing the same thing, right? Except for probably not Alf, because Alf didn't exist back then. Um, maybe the New Testament would have been a lot cooler if it, if it did, right? Um, if they had a, an alien that came in and ate your cat, right? <laughs> but the thing about it is he kind of looked at them as, as these people who, who masked, hid behind their position, right? And took. They took and took and took what wasn't theirs. Check this out. It says, as Jesus was speaking, uh, one of the Pharisees invited him home for a meal. All right. So, so far, so good. So he went in and took his place at the table and his host was amazed to see that he sat down to eat without first performing the hand washing ceremony required by Jewish custom. Then the Lord said, uh, yeah, then the Lord said to him, uh, you Pharisees are so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish. But inside, you're filthy. You're full of greed and you're full of wickedness. Fools. Didn't God make the inside as well as the outside? So clean the inside by giving gifts to the poor and, and, and you'll be clean all over. What sorrow awaits you, Pharisees, for you are careful to tithe even the tiniest, tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore justice and the love of God. You should tithe, yes, but don't neglect the more important things. What are those more important things? Jesus, Jesus went on record saying, I desire mercy more than sacrifice. He says, what sorrow awaits you, you Pharisees, for you love to sit in the seats of honor in the synagogues and and receive respectful greetings as you walk in the marketplace. Yes, what sorrow awaits you, for you are like hidden graves in a field. People walk over them without knowing the corruption that they're stepping on. Teacher, said an expert of religious law, You've insulted us too in what you've just said. Yes, said Jesus. What sorrow also awaits you experts in religious law. For you crush people with unbearable religious demands that you never lift a finger to ease the burden. What sorrow awaits you? For you build monuments for the prophets that your own ancestors killed a long time ago. 
But in fact, you stand as witnesses who agree to what, to what your ancestors did. He's like, you're a walking contradiction. You're building idols to these ancestors that your ancestors killed. Which side of this are you on then, right? They killed the prophets and, and you join in their crime by building monuments. This is, this is what God in his wisdom said about you. Therefore, the wisdom of God said, I will send prophets and apostles to them. But they will kill some and persecute the others. As a result, this generation will be held responsible for the murder of all God's prophets. From the creation of the world. From the, from the murder of Abel to the murder of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. In the church. Murdered in the church. Yes, it will certainly be charged against this generation. What sorrow awaits you experts in religious law? You fat rats. Right? For you remove the key to knowledge from the people. You, you don't enter the kingdom yourselves. And you prevent others from entering too. As Jesus was leaving, the teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees became hostile and tried to provoke him with many more questions. They wanted to trap him, saying something. Uh, they wanted to trap him into saying something that they could use against him. They're playing the game. From the second the religious leader, the Pharisee, invited him to dinner, he knew what was going down. Jesus wasn't a person to them. He was a pawn. Jesus wasn't a person to him. He was something to be played in this game so they could win power and prestige, right? Jesus looks at these guys and he says, you guys are hypocrites. Do you know what the word hypocrite means? It was actually a, a, a word used in, in pop culture at, in Jesus' time. It simply meant actor. You guys are just actors, you're posers. Right? You're just playing a role of a religious leader. He basically says, you act like religious leaders, but you are actually thieves and murderers. The biggest thing is that they demand that people follow rules that no one can follow to completion. Not even themselves. But their position allows them not to have to own up to that part. Right, So they take power and sin offerings and sacrifices, and position from the people. And then they sit on their high horses. Boy, I'm glad we don't have people like that anymore. Man, it'd be, it'd be bad if we did, right? It'd be bad. I mean, honestly, that's what religious leaders are. They are a career politician who does nothing and demands everything. Then eventually walk away with a huge pension. Like the same problems we're dealing with today, Jesus spoke into whenever he was alive. Jesus even says uh, in other encounters with them, you are like whitewashed tombs. You look clean on the outside, but you're dead on the inside. And all you do is take, 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 take. The mask of power and position is a heavy mask to bear, I'm sure. It normally takes taking to get there though rarely giving just taking but but what happens when we flip the script uh, on these religious leaders and 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 we and they become generous and thoughtful and hard working and don't use people as stepping stones to get to their positions well I think we all end up better off. And if we all end up better off, then we're all on the same level playing field. Then what is there to dance around? Nothing, right? Everyone ends up better off, especially the ones who have been stepped on this whole time. So masks, yeah, they're fun. They're fun this time of year. But I wish we could just keep it that way. Like make it a thing we do for Halloween but we don't, right? Instead, what we, what we do is we, we use them to hide. We use them to hide who we really are, which eventually catches up to us and explodes, right? And we use them to play this, this dangerous game where people are normally the pawns. And we use them to take we use them to take power and position and credit 
for things that we don't deserve, all so that we can get ahead, so we can get what we want. So over the next few weeks, my prayer is that we can learn to recognize where we are being ingenuine, where we are hiding, where we are playing, and where we are taking, and correct that course. Even if it's just a little bit. And I believe that it's going to make a sweeter life for everybody involved. And it should start in the church. Right? It should start with us. We should stop hiding. We should stop playing. And we should stop taking. So as a church, let's take the next few weeks to figure out what we can do to fix that. Father, I thank you so much for this day. I thank you for the fact that... um, that we're back here, and that we can be here, that we can be amongst one another, that we can love on one another and pick on one another, that we can enjoy one another's presence and company. Father, I pray that we can, um, even if it just starts right here, where we can kind of shed those masks and stop dancing around things and, and, and be ourselves amongst one another, to encourage one another to deal with what it is we have to deal with, to encourage one another to stop, to stop playing around and using people as pawns, and to encourage one another to stop taking and maybe start giving. Lord, we thank you for this ultimate example of who it is we should be in your son Jesus, who came, who lived, who died, who is buried and beat sin and death and hell so that we can have life. A true, genuine, joyous life. Father, help us to step into that. It's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. See you guys next week.